Welcome to today's web seminar. This is Simone Turek Lee with John Burton Advocates for Youth. We're going to give people about 30 more seconds to get joined. Great. Well, let's get started. Thanks for joining us today. This is the second webinar that we've hosted today in a two-part series on completing the FAFSA. Again, this is Simone Turek Lee. I'm with John Burton Advocates for Youth. And this afternoon webinar is going to walk you through how to complete the FAFSA or the free application for federal student aid for homeless youth. So earlier today, we also hosted a web seminar that walked you through how to complete the FAFSA for, um, for those who assist current and former foster youth. And we know that many homeless youth um, have had foster care history, so we also encourage you to check out our morning webinar. There was, someone just submitted a question and said, is there going to be different information on this afternoon's webinar? There will be some different information in certain sections. However, a lot of it will be repetitive, some of the more general we're going through every page of the FAFSA pretty much, so some of the more general sections, there will be repetition, but the biggest difference will be the, the section where a student um, gets uh, identified as an independent student, they get that independent student status, that is where the major differences will be. So we do, do encourage you, um, either if you work with foster youth as well, to either view this morning's webinar or to look up the, um, the California um, Financial Aid Guide for Foster Youth, which is a publication that we've put out and is available on our website. So let's get started. So first, just for some technical information, we always share this in the beginning of our web seminars. If you are having any audio issues and you're listening through your computer speakers, we do recommend um, trying to call in using a telephone. You usually get better audio that way. And we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation and then compiling them into a list to address during our Q&A at the end of the web seminar. So to submit those questions, just go to the control panel. You can see an example of it on, that, on the slide there. And then type it into the question box and hit send. And then lastly, we always post these recordings along with the slide deck on our website under the training archive so you can get it there. And we also send out um, the presentation and the recording to everyone who's registered later today. So I'm not doing this alone uh, by far. Um, I'm joined by Jessica Petros, who is also with John Burton Advocates for Youth. She's going to kind of walk us through the bulk of the FAFSA application. And then for Q&A, we have Mark Kantrowitz, and he is the publisher and VP of research um, with savingsforcollege.com. And uh, he and his colleague, David Levy, um, which is a special consultant to the Vice President of Student Services at, at Coastline Community College, um, are you know, integral to making sure that all of the information that we put in our um, publications about financial aid and into today's web seminars are accurate. Um, because we, um, you know, among uh, doing trainings on financial aid, do many other things, and it is not our one specific area of expertise. And so we always turn to, to the experts to make sure that all this very technical information is correct that we're sharing with you. So thanks for, for that support. So the financial aid process, before we get started and kind of jump into um, the nitty gritty of the application, we just want to give people some overview, kind of some context here. So obviously the financial aid process, you know, there are steps that go beyond just submitting the FAFSA. Um, you've got to submit the FAFSA or the California DREAM Act application if you are an undocumented student. 
um, you then have to complete what's called kind of complete the file or go through the verification process. So there's a little bit of follow-up that we will also talk about today. And then the other parts that we're not going to talk much about today are the application is processed, um, the award notification or the package, you know, is then um, communicated to the student, and then the actual money is just dispersed. So, um, and then there's this, this sixth step, which is kind of off the arrow because it's often not thought of as part of the financial aid process, but it's incredibly important. So we always want to kind of include it when we talk about financial aid, which is maintaining your financial aid. So how do you not lose your financial aid? Very important. Um, and we do have past webinars that cover that content. So if you want to know more about that, check out those webinars. But today that's not, not our focus. Today we are just talking about kind of the really mainly the first um, square there and then a little bit, just a little bit on the second. So uh, sources and types of aid. So just for people who aren't maybe so familiar with financial aid, you know, there are really kind of four categories of financial aid. There's state, which um, an example of state aid would be like the Cal Grant. Uh, there's federal aid, an example would be the Pell Grant. And then there are actual, you know, post-secondary education institutions that grant out money. And then organizations and private companies. Um, oftentimes we get, you know, maybe scholarships from these types of um, organizations. And then on the right side of, of the screen, you kind of see um, the form that the aid comes in. So there are fee waivers where you basically don't have to um, pay for the, the, the enrollment fees for the, for the college. So an example of that is what used to be called the Board of Governors fee waiver or the BOG fee waiver. We now call it the California Community College Promise Grant. Um, and then there are grants. Uh, which generally do not have to be, you know, paid back as long as you're not um, enrolling in courses, getting the aid, and then dropping a bunch of them. Sometimes when that happens, um, money does have to be paid back. But generally speaking, you know, grants do not have to be paid back. And then, of course, there are scholarships, which are, um, you know, there are a range of scholarships that you can apply for. And then uh, work study. Work study is is working. You earn a paycheck, but it's something that you qualify for through the financial aid process, and uh, often is you know um, like working on campus. Loans. Everyone knows about these loans. We have to pay these back, and we have to pay them back with interest. Um, I'm sure many of us on this webinar still pay on our on our college loans. Um, so this is something we definitely want to educate students about. It's not the same thing as getting a grant. So let's move on to just kind of defining need. So like we mentioned, some types of aid are, they are need-based. And so how do you determine what this need is? So first you take um, what's called the cost of attendance. So the total amount um, that it costs to attend a particular college. So that includes tuition, housing, books, supplies, kind of the whole gamut, not just tuition. Um, then you subtract what's called the expected family contribution. And that's the amount that the student's able to, um, well, that the, that the uh, FAFSA determines that the student is able to contribute um, to their cost of attendance. So it's generally based on income, assets, household size, and other, uh, other things. And for those that have parental contribution, that's really essentially what this is, right? Um, so you take cost of attendance, you subtract expected family contribution, and then you get what is considered your eligibility for need-based aid. And um, that's the grants that, that I mentioned, um, some of the you know, subsidized loans um, and uh, fee waivers, and then some scholarships. So common types of financial aid. I know there's a lot on the screen. We have the whole FAFSA application to get through, so I'm not going to go over each and every one of these. I'll just mention, you know, these are the more common types of financial aid. You've got the Pell Grant, um, the Cal Grant. The Cal Grant is our state's largest financial aid program and has, you know, more than one type. Um, you probably know when I mentioned the, um, the Promise Grant, which used to be called the Bog Fee Waiver waiving uh, fees at community colleges. Um, and at the bottom, you see the Chafee Grant. This is a grant that's specifically for foster youth who have been in care on or after age 16. Now, again, I left it on there because I know some homeless youth um, do have foster care histories. And you want to make sure that they're getting all of the financial aid that they're eligible for. So make sure that this is something that, that you're aware of 
when you're working with young people who may have had previous foster care involvement. And I also just want to say that there have been recent changes to the Chafee Grant and also to the Cal Grant for foster youth. Um, for example, the Chafee Grant used to be um, uh, up to age 22, and now it's been extended up to age 26. So um, big change. The Cal Grant also has had about, you know, three different changes for foster youth. Uh, and if you do work with foster youth, I suggest that you check those out. You can learn about them in the Financial Aid Guide for Foster Youth that's on our website. But we just aren't going to go over them today because we want to make sure that we um, get into the nitty gritty of the application for homeless youth. Um, so, and then, oh, one more thing to mention, mention here, um, well, two more things to mention. One is that, you know, some of these cover tuition and some are what are considered cash aid, um, where there's actually money, um, you know, deposited into the student's account, and then they are responsible for using it for, um, to assist them with, with school-related or life-related, you know, expenses. Um, but the, the tuition, um, the aid that covers tuition, you can only get one of those grants. So you can't get um, doubled up, you know, covering your tuition twice. It's just enough to cover the tuition um, of the school you're attending. And then the other thing to just remember is that any assistance that's provided by on-campus programs, um, so gift cards or whatnot, are counted as part of an award package. So that is taken into consideration. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Petros, and she is going to kind of start walking us through the FAFSA application. Great. Thank you, Simone. So we can go to the next slide. So there are two different applications that a student can look at to apply for financial aid. The first option is the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And this is for students that are U.S. citizens, permanent residents, or other eligible non-citizens. For example, that might be someone that's a U.S. permanent resident that has a green card. And they can fill out that FAFSA application on the website that's listed there. The other option is for eligible and documented immigrants. And those students can complete the California DREAM Act application, and the website for that application is listed there. Now, while these applications are available on these websites, students can also fill out these applications via paper if they prefer. We do recommend that students fill them out electronically just to reduce and minimize any errors. Next slide. So just a few other things to keep in mind if you're working with any undocumented students that are filling out the California DREAM Act application. The California DREAM Act application is a state application, so it does not allow students to qualify for federal financial aid, such as the Pell Grant. They'll only be able to qualify for financial aid that's offered through the state of California, such as the Cal Grant. Also to keep in mind, I think in today's world, for a lot of undocumented students, there could be a lot of fear over self-identifying. Some students might be hesitant to even fill out the application. So I would just remind them that all the data that's provided in this application is completely confidential and it is not shared with the federal government in any way. So just to reassure them that it's okay and it's safe to fill out this application. Now for some students, there can often be confusion about the DACA program. The California DREAM Act is a separate program in the state of California, it is separate from DACA, so it does not matter if someone has DACA or does not have DACA, that is a federal program. So a student can still apply for the California DREAM Act even if they are not a DACA recipient. If you're working with a student though that is a DACA recipient and they've been granted a temporary social security number, they still need to fill out the California DREAM Act application. And also to note, you know, today's webinar, we're going to be going through each question on the FAFSA, but the questions in the California DREAM Act do mirror the questions on the FAFSA, except for certain questions about things like social security number. So if you are working with any students that are filling out the California DREAM Act, this webinar will still help you and provide useful information to support them in filling out that application as well. Next slide. Also to note, if you're working with any undocumented children, um, particularly those that work with foster youth, they might be eligible for something called special immigration juvenile status, 
which allows certain youth to be able to apply to become a lawful permanent resident. Now, from many of these students who are applying for special immigration juvenile status, it can take sometimes years before their application is processed. So just to note, even if they've filled out the application to get this type of status, they're still not eligible for federal financial aid while their application is pending or being processed. And so they'll still need to fill out the California DREAM Act application. And if any of you are working with any youth in foster care that are undocumented, um, I would definitely have them contact their child welfare agency to see if applying for SIJS status is a good fit for them, because um, they would need to apply while they are still minors. Next slide. So in addition to the websites I listed before, this year the federal government listed another option for students to apply for the FAFSA. They can now apply on an app on their smartphones. And so you'll see here we have the information if the student wants to download their app. Uh, this app on their mobile phone. And the great thing about this app is they can even, for example, start the application on their app and maybe finish it on the website or vice versa. So this is a great new option for students as well. Next slide. So when should students apply? So you now know there's two options. Students either fill out the FAFSA or the California DREAM Act. And there's a priority application period. Students are encouraged to apply between October 1st through March 2nd, before the start of the school year that they're going to begin college. Now, students can definitely apply after March 2nd if they miss the deadline, but they might be eligible for less money. So we really encourage that they get in their application by March 2nd, but if for some reason they miss that, still have them apply. There are some colleges that may also have earlier priority deadlines. So if that's the case, make sure the student checks in with each college that they're applying to to see if they have any earlier priority deadlines. And students can fill out this application even before they've applied to college. So I would encourage them to get in as soon as possible um, to get the maximum award possible. And just to note too, when we're talking about October 1st through March 2nd, this would be, for example, if a student is applying to school in fall of 2019, they would be working on that application currently right now. Next slide. So whether working with a student or referring them to a financial aid workshop, you wanna make sure that they have all the information that they need to be able to sit down and fill out that application successfully. So there's a few things that they wanna to bring to fill out that application. The first thing is they're gonna to need to know their social security number or their alien registration number. Um, as a tip, make sure that the student knows not only their social security number, but also their name exactly as it appears on their social security card. Maybe they go by a nickname. They may have never even seen their actual social security card, and it's quite possible that their name might be listed differently on that card. So make sure that they get their card and have that information. They won't be able to even start the application without having their social security number. They're also going to need an email address. Um, there's going to be a lot of really critical information that's going to be sent to them via email. So you want to make sure that they have an email that they can have access to, that they still know the password to, that they can check often. And if any of you are working with high school students, a lot of times many high school students, the only email they have is the one that's been issued to them from their high school. And oftentimes those are temporary and can expire. So if that's the case, I would definitely work with that student to create a new email address like a Gmail, or Yahoo uh, to make sure that they're able to access it throughout their college journey. And for a lot of students, this might take a little bit of time, so just be prepared to support them in that. Um, next, they're also going to need to bring a list of the colleges that they're interested in applying to. As I mentioned before, it's okay if they haven't yet applied, but this is just the list of schools that they intend to apply to. They need to enter at least one college, but they can list up to 10 colleges. And we'll talk more about that later on in the webinar. And lastly, they're going to need to bring their student tax or income information from the prior, prior year. So what that means is if you have a student, for example, right now that's applying for their FAFSA and they're planning on starting school in the fall of 2019, so the 2019-2020 academic school year, the FAFSA is going to ask them about their income information from 2017. So just keep that in mind and make sure the student's prepared to bring 
any tax information, if they filed taxes, or any information about any other income they may have received from the prior prior year. Next slide. So now we're ready to dive into the FAFSA application. This is a screenshot that shows you what the home page looks like. Um, for those of you who have done the FAFSA before, you might recognize that there's a whole new layout to the FAFSA this year. There's been some changing to the wording of certain questions. I think a lot of these changes have really been positive and are now making the questions less confusing for students. So you'll notice some of these changes as we go through the application. But students can go to the fafsa.ed.gov website and this is a free application and students can simply click the button that says start here to begin. Next slide. So just to note, the FAFSA must be completed every year. So if you're working with any students that have filled out the FAFSA in the past, they can log in as a returning user just by clicking log in and some of the information from their prior FAFSA will be pre-filled in the current application. Next slide. So the first step in the process is to create something called an SSA ID, the Federal Student Aid Identification. Next slide. So once the student clicks to start the application, they'll come to this login page. You'll see there's two options. One is I am the student on the left-hand side, and then the other one is I'm the parent. So they're gonna to wanna to click the option that says I am the student, and they're gonna to wanna to click the blue button there that says create one to create that FSA ID. That FSA ID is gonna serve as their legal signature to be able to sign it at the end. So once they click that button, they'll actually be taken to a new separate page. So you go to the next slide, please. And this is the first screen that's gonna pop up when they're creating that FSA ID. It's gonna ask the student a series of questions. In my experience, the FSA ID can often be the part of the application that takes students the longest, so just keep that in mind. So it's gonna start off by asking them to enter an email address to create a username and password. And we wanna make sure that they think of something unique and secure. Next slide. Here's where they'll enter their name and their social security number. Again, this is the name that appears exactly as it's shown on their social security card. As you can see, they can only enter it once, so we wanna make sure that they enter it slowly and accurately. Now, if you're working with any youth that don't know their social security number, this could be a great time for them to apply for a new social security card. This is something that they'll probably need for future employment or even a work-study job as well. Next slide. Here is where they're gonna enter a mailing address and a mobile phone. Now the mobile phone is optional, they don't have to enter it, but it is recommended. Um, it just helps in case they get locked out of their account to easily recover their account and be able to log back in and have that unlocked. And if they don't have a mailing address, definitely work with that youth to come up with a plan of an address that they can enter. Next slide. So this next section are different challenge questions. Uh, sometimes for some students, this could be really easy to answer and quick, and for other students, it might take them a little bit of time. So they'll just have to come up with different challenge questions and answers, um, and they might need your support in that process as well. So once they review that all that information is correct, they're pretty much done. You can go to the next slide. They simply review the terms and conditions, click the button to agree and then they are done with creating their FSA ID. Next slide. As you'll have noted, the student will have just created a lot of different items, an FSA ID username, a password. For many students, they may have just created a new email address and another new password, as well as challenge questions and answers. So make sure to take a moment to pause, work with that student and have them write this down somewhere safe so they can access it in the future. A lot of times students uh, are not gonna be able to remember all this information. So maybe 
they write it down, maybe they take a photo of it, maybe they email it to themselves, but just work with them to come up with a plan that works best for them so that they have this somewhere safe and that they don't forget. Next slide. So once their FSA ID has been processed and verified, which can be a very quick process, uh, they're now ready to start their online FS or their online FAFSA. Next slide. So they'll go back to this login page. Again, click the button that says I am the student. And now they will log back in with their newly created FSA ID username and password. Next slide. The first slide that comes up is just a simple disclaimer. They can just click accept and then move on to the next slide. So the first question is asking them to indicate which academic school year that they're applying to. So this can be confusing for some students, right? We're in 2018, they might think, oh, I need to fill out the 2018 application, but they're asking the student to identify which academic school year that they're planning to attend. So just to remind students that the fall term is usually what's considered the beginning of the school year. So if a student is planning on attending school in fall of 2019, they would select the 2019-2020 FAFSA. However, if you're working with a student that's planning on applying for a summer session, that's usually considered part of the prior academic year. So if they're planning on doing a summer session next year, that would be part of the 2018-2019 application. Next slide. So the student has to create yet another password, even though they've already just created all those other ones. On this page, they have to create something that is called the save key. This is in case they don't fill out their application all in one sitting and they wanna be able to log back in later and finish it. They can actually log back in within 45 days to complete and submit the FAFSA. So they must create the save key and then they can move along in the application. Next slide. So again, just as a tip, along with all the other information that we want the student to write down safe so they don't forget, please also add the save key to that list so they're able to log back in as well. Next slide. So here is just a general introduction page, general overview information about the FAFSA if the student wants to read it. If not, they can just click next to move along. Next slide. And here you'll see, I wanna bring your attention to the top of the screen. You'll notice there's seven sections to the FAFSA, starting with student demographics and moving along to the sign and submit section and confirmation. So we're gonna walk through each section on the FAFSA today and all the questions within there. Also just to note, there's a save button at the top so students can save their information as they move along. And if they have any questions about any of the questions within the FAFSA, they can just simply click that little blue icon with the question mark and there'll be more detailed information and instructions for each question. Next slide. So the first section is the student demographics section. There's two parts, so we'll walk through those together. Next slide. The first questions here, we're gonna ask them to enter again, their last name, their first name, and their social security number and date of birth. Again, please remind the students to enter in their information exactly as it appears on their social security card. Next slide. Here is where they're gonna enter a permanent mailing address. So I know for some students that are experiencing homelessness, this might be challenging. Um, it can be a PO box if that works best for the student. So you might need to sit down with them and work with them on a plan on where would be the best place to receive mail. And if they aren't able to identify a place, they can definitely talk to their college that they're applying to, to that financial aid administrator, to see if they can use that address as well. And here again is where they're gonna enter their email address. And this is where a lot of really critical information is gonna be sent to them. So we'll make sure they've got a accurate and good email to list as well. Next slide. So on this slide, it's asking them about their state of legal residence. This is to see about their eligibility for state aid. 
So in the state of California, that state aid is called the Cal Grant, and this is to determine their eligibility based on their residency. Um, there's no separate application that needs to be filled out for the Cal Grant. They'll find the information that they need through this website. It's going to ask them if they've lived in California for at least five years. And then if they haven't, they will ask them to say the date of when they became a legal resident of California. So just to note, while it says at least five years, every state's criteria is a little bit different. So in the state of California, for example, uh, they only need to have been living in the state as a resident for at least one year to qualify for the Cal Grant. And while there's no separate application to fill out for the Cal Grant, it is really critical that the student's high school submits their verified GPA so that it can be matched to their FAFSA. High schools should do this automatically, but sometimes it doesn't happen. So it's really important that the student actually takes the time to check in with their high school and verify that their high school has sent their GPA in so that they can be eligible for the Cal Grant. Next slide. This slide is pretty, pretty straightforward. The first question is just asking them if they're a male or a female. And just to note that this is based off of not their preferred gender, but on their sex as assigned at birth, that's on their birth certificate. It's then gonna ask them a telephone number. Um, it's actually not required. If they don't have one, they don't need to put one in for the FAFSA. Same thing with driver's license, that's not a required field. If they don't have one, that's just fine and it won't affect any of their eligibility as well. Next slide. The next question is gonna ask them about their marital status as of today. So for some students, you might just wanna clarify, even if they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or they're living with a significant other, they're not considered married. So it's really asking about um, their legal marital status. So you might need to clarify that with some students. Next. Here, there's a question asking if they're a U.S. citizen. There's actually three options. They can either say, yes, I am a U.S. citizen or U.S. national. Uh, no, but I am an eligible non-citizen, in which case this is where they would provide their alien registration number. Or the third option is, no, I am not a citizen or eligible non-citizen. If that's the case, that third option, then they should be filling out the California Dream Act application instead. Now, the next question, if on the prior set of questions they had indicated that they are a male, the FAFSA is actually going to ask them if they're registered with the Selective Service System. It's actually a required requirement of the federal government that they will not give a student federal aid unless they are registered with the Selective Service System. And if they are not yet registered, the federal government makes it very easy for them to register, and they can just simply click yes and automatically register within the system right then and there within the FAFSA. Next slide. So this set of questions is asking about their educational status and goals. The first one is gonna be asking them what will their high school completion status be when they begin college in 2019, 2020? So maybe they will be expecting to receive their high school diploma, maybe it's their GED or a high school equivalency certificate. Uh, these things are required to be able to receive federal aid or state aid. The next question is asking them, what will their college grade level be when they begin school? Now, for many of you working with high school students, it's very common that many high school students these days um, are actually duly enrolled in college courses. So they might think, oh, I should say that it's not my first year, I'm already taking college courses. Well, actually, if they were a high school student and they were duly enrolled, they're still considered a first-time college student. So they would actually select the question that says, never attended college or first year. The next question is asking them, what degree or certificate will they be working on when they begin the school year? Now, some of you might be working with students who aren't sure. They're undecided, so they might think, okay, I'll click the button that says other undecided. We actually recommend that they don't select the option that says other or undecided because they might actually receive less financial aid. We really do encourage that they do select one of the options about their college or educational goal. 
And if they're not sure if they're wanting to pursue a two-year or a four-year, we would recommend that they actually select four-year or first bachelor's degree um, as their initial educational goal. This will just help them potentially get offered even more money. Next slide. So here are the students gonna be asked if they're interested in being considered for work study. A lot of times students don't know what work study is. They've never heard that term. So you might wanna give them a little background information about what that means. Um, so they can do a few different things. They can say, yes, I'm interested, but just by saying yes, it doesn't mean that they're automatically going to receive work study. And also just to keep in mind that even if they say yes and are offered work study, they can always decline later if they change their mind and decide that they're not interested. The next question is asking if you're a foster youth or if you were a foster youth at any time in the foster care system. So if any of you are working with youth who are current or former foster youth, I would highly encourage that they answer yes to this question, even if they were in foster care for just one day. Now by checking yes, it doesn't automatically enroll them into any programs or things of that nature. However, a lot of colleges, the way that they find out who their foster youth are, are by answering yes to this question. And a lot of our colleges have a robust system of support programs specifically for foster youth. So this can be a great way to get them connected to the support programs on their campus. So definitely we would advise that they answer yes there. And next you'll see that there's questions asking the student about the highest educational level completed by their parent. Um, for many students, they may not be in touch with their parents. They may not know this information, whether it's a homeless youth or a foster youth. So definitely let the student know it's completely okay if they just wanna select other or unknown. Um, it doesn't affect their eligibility or anything of that nature. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, the FAFSA must be completed every year and it's gonna ask them if they've ever received federal student aid before. If they have, it's gonna ask them a series of questions. The rule from the federal government is that students, if they receive federal financial aid, that they cannot be convicted for the possession or sale of illegal drugs um, for that offense while receiving federal student aid. So it's gonna ask them if that happened while they were receiving federal student aid. Now, if they answer yes, and they have been convicted while receiving federal student aid, they'll have to answer a series of questions on a worksheet to determine whether that's going to affect their eligibility for federal student aid moving forward. Now, if it does affect their eligibility, there are still some steps that students can take to regain their eligibility, such as completing an approved drug rehab program or passing two unannounced drug tests. Next slide. So the next section in the FAFSA is the school selection section. Next slide. So if a student answered on one of the prior questions that they're going to be receiving their high school diploma, the FAFSA is gonna to wanna to know which high school that they're graduating from. So students can either type in the name of their high school or they can click the search button to find their high school. Definitely recommend that students just find their high school by looking to the search button. It's really easy for a student to make a typo or enter the information differently than how it's listed. And we wanna make sure that the FAFSA is able to find their high school so that they're able to get their GPA matched with their FAFSA application to be able to potentially receive the Cal Grant. So encourage students to search for their high school there. Now, if the student on the prior slide said, that they will not be receiving their high school diploma, but instead they'll be receiving a GED certificate or high school equivalent certificate, they won't have to provide any other further information. Next slide. So in this section, the students will identify which colleges they are interested or planning to attend. They have to at least enter one college, but they can enter up to 10 colleges and the information that's filled out on the FAFSA will be sent to all the schools that they've selected. Now, things can change, plans can change, and that's definitely fine. Um, if a student ends up changing the plan of where they're planning on attending the college, they can always go back in later and change the colleges that they indicated. Next slide. 
So just to note too, you might have a student that wants to apply to more to 10 colleges, and that's definitely an option as well. The way that they can do that is enter their initial 10 colleges, complete and submit their FAFSA. Once they receive their student aid report, also known as the STAR, then they can actually go back in, replace the original set of 10 colleges with a new set of up to 10 colleges. And they can do this as many times as they want, depending on how many, how many colleges they're interested in applying to. They just need to wait until they get that student aid report to be able to make those changes. Next slide. So this is where the student actually searches and selects for the colleges. If they happen to know the school's federal school code, they can definitely enter it. Otherwise, they can just search to find the college that they're looking for, either by state or by city or by school name. Next slide. And as they search for those colleges, it will generate a list. They can just select and add that to their list and click Next. And once they've selected all of those colleges, you'll see that there'll be a list that shows all the ones that they've indicated. And just to note too, if any of you are working with students who are applying to a UC or a CSU, they do need to indicate each individual UC or each individual CSU that they are planning on attending to. And you know, some students may not know the difference between a community college or a private school or a for-profit. So this could be an opportunity to also make sure that they're educated and aware, and so they know what their options are and what they're signing up for as well. So once they've selected the schools, it's gonna ask them what their housing plans are. They can either select on campus, off campus, or with parents. Now, if a student is applying to a college that offers on-campus housing, such as a dorm, we actually recommend that they select on campus because they might be able to receive more financial aid. Now, if they're living off campus, maybe you're working with a foster youth who's planning to live with their foster parent, a relative caregiver, um, or someone in that category, we would still advise that they select off campus instead of with parents. By selecting off campus, so again, will be offered more money than if they're selecting with parents. Next slide. So now we have the dependency status section, and I'm gonna turn this over to Simone to walk you through this and special considerations for homeless youth. Thanks, Jessica. Um, thanks for getting us through that very efficiently. Um, I'm actually going to pause for a second. We have got several of, um, several people have submitted the same question, and that tells me we should answer it now. <laughs> so Jessica, you had talked about um, a mailing address. So inputting a mailing address for, for students and what happens when they don't have a mailing address, right? So they don't have an actual residence. Um, so often, you know, with homeless youth, this will, this will come up, this will be an issue. And so people are wondering, you know, what do you recommend for a mailing address for those families who are homeless? And so I want to just address that and say that it definitely does not have to be um, where the youth lives. They may not have a home. Um, it just has to be a mailing address where the youth can reliably receive mail. Uh, mail. And it could be, it, that could be the address of um, a relative or a friend who's given them permission to, to get mail there, or it could even be the college. Um, but I do want to say that if it is the college's address that you plan on using, um, the student should, should contact the school for permission and just get instructions to, to ensure that the mail gets to them. This is something that the colleges should be familiar with. Um, and I imagine they have some sort of process for this. Um, and also for those who might be in housing programs, uh, you know, that's another option as well as talking to that organization and seeing if, if that could just be your mailing address, because that is where you're living um, at the time, even if not a permanent address. And then another note about this, just if, if the student does find more permanent housing, they should update their address on the FAFSA when they get that. So all the other questions we will leave to the end, but I just thought we had got so many of that same question, I wanted to, to get to it. So the dependency status section, very important to, um, to make sure that we know how to kind of counsel youth about getting through this section, because this section is where they will potentially identify as an independent student, which is key for them getting you know, that, that need-based aid. 
So first, uh, and you know, just to go a little bit more into what is an independent student. So independent student status means that you do not have to provide any information, including income information, about parents. So that includes biological parents, adoptive parents, foster parents, relative caregivers, um, legal guardians, and like I said, it really it means the student would qualify for you know the need-based aid unless the student has some very high income um, themselves. Um, so a really key here is giving them you know very clear instructions on how to kind of navigate this section. The way it works is if any of the dependency questions are answered yes. Uh, they only need to answer yes once, so that would qualify them. So once one of the questions is answered yes, the remaining questions basically disappear, and the applicant kind of continues through the application, the FAFSA application, and is considered an independent student. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take you through this section and show you how, as a homeless youth, they would complete this section. So. If you, like I said, if you answered those first few questions on the previous page um, as no, you would get these next two dependency questions. Um, and then answering yes to either of these, you know, regard, questions regard, um, regarding having dependents of their own um, would give the student independent student status. We're going to assume that the answer is no here. We're going to keep preceding, uh, proceeding along um, as if we are not parenting with dependents. And then we get the next screen. So we do want to pause here for a second. As, as Jessica has mentioned, as I've mentioned, we know that uh, many homeless youth do have foster care history. And if a youth was in foster care at any point since turning 13, so if they were in foster care one day after their 13th birthday, or if they were in a legal guardianship with someone other than their parent or step parent, they should check one of those corresponding boxes there on the screen. Um, you know, being homeless, uh, yes, they, they might qualify as a homeless um, student, as an independent student by way of their homeless status, but it's actually, if they have, if they do qualify as a foster youth, they should certainly um, go that route. It is a much less onerous verification process, and foster youth only have to identify as foster youth once, whereas homeless youth will have to submit this, this homeless youth determination on an annual basis. So definitely, if you can qualify as a foster youth, go that route. But again, we are going to assume for the sake of this webinar that they do not have a foster care history, and we're going to select none of the above, and we're going to keep continuing on here. So then you get this next screen. Um, if the student selected none of the above, you know, this is where they would, they would be taking it, but then ask them um, whether on or after uh, July 1st of the year prior to the award year, so in this case it's saying 2018, um, they were homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. So then the student would obviously answer yes here if they're a homeless student, and it would, um, and this would give the student um, independent student status um, pending kind of the next follow-up questions. So once you hit yes, you're taken to this screen. And then uh, this is really about, like I said, providing a homeless youth determination, which is really what it is to verify that homeless youth status. Now you see on the screen there, there are three kind of authorities listed. And we're going to get into this a little bit deeper in a second. But I do want to say students should really try to get a determination letter from one of these three authorities listed um, versus saying none of the above. Um, and we're going to actually continue on and uh, kind of pause on the application here, continue to kind of break down the definition of, of what it is to be a homeless youth in terms of the FAFSA, and then talk a little bit about those three authorities. So we're pausing on the application. We will revisit it in a few minutes. And uh, let's get into the definition of homeless youth here. So as you can see on the screen, the student must be unaccompanied. Um, which is not in the physical custody of a parent or guardian. And I know people are probably going, well, we're talking about non-minors usually. Um, most of these cases, uh, these are college students, so most are going to be non-minors. Um, so what is unaccompanied? You know, unaccompanied is this kind of the same thing it is for a minor. It's not, uh, not living with their, their uh, parent or guardian. Um, we know that a, a lot of, of us, um, 
you know, through our lives that have to live with our parents, maybe beyond age 18. That's not something that's rare in, in society at this day and age. So there are several college students that might live with their parents well beyond age 18. So uh, the key here is unaccompanied, not with the parent or guardian. Um, and uh, I will say if they are homeless and they're with their parents, so meaning they're homeless, they have a homeless family, so they're homeless along with one or more of their parents, um, say they're living in a family shelter or somewhere else, um, they wouldn't be considered an independent student. They would still report their parents' information on the FAFSA. Now, just a little digression, but assuming that they're homeless and their parents probably have little to no income, they would likely still qualify for a need-based aid, okay? They just wouldn't qualify as an independent student to get that need-based aid. So let's assume for the you know, for this uh, webinar, again, the student is unaccompanied, so not in the physical custody of a parent or guardian. So they have to be unaccompanied and homeless by the McKinney-Vento definition, which is lacking fixed and regular and adequate housing. Um, or, so unaccompanied and homeless, or unaccompanied and self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. So self-supporting um, being uh, paying for his or home, her own living expenses, including fixed, regular, and adequate housing. And then at risk of homelessness being defined as when a student's housing may, may cease to be fixed, regular, and adequate. And then an example is just a student who's being evicted and has been unable to find fixed, regular, and adequate housing. And then a clarification here, um, if the student is living in the school dormitory, um, they may still be considered unaccompanied homeless if the student would otherwise be homeless. So that's important to note. And then you can see on the screen, another thing to note is, um, you know, and this is in the application and verification guide, um, a student living in any of these situations and fleeing an abusive parent um, also may be considered homeless, even if the parent would provide support and a place to live. So that's a little bit um, in the details about how do we define homeless youth. And that's important because those of us on the webinar who are, um, you know, one of the three authorities that might be able to provide a determination letter or that are just a... Um, a person that could, and you'll learn about this later, but that might be able to provide some evidence to the financial aid administrator that the youth is homeless or just, you know, uh, vouch for it, basically. Um, it's important that we know that this is a role that we can play. And obviously, to play this role, we need to know what the definition is. So just to dive in a little deeper, um, the key, I know this is a lot of reading, and you don't have to read it right now, but the key thing to pay attention to here is the underlined uh, text. Um, it includes children and youth who are sharing the housing of other persons due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason. So I think it can be confusing because someone could say, well, a lot of college students are living doubled up. Um, that's just kind of the college lifestyle. But the, the difference is, is that they'd be sharing this housing because, you know, they lost their housing or they have, um, and or they have you know economic hardship and they also lack fixed regular and adequate housing so this is basically what that underlying part is doing is it's just clarifying that couch surfing is considered homeless if all other parts of the definition apply so let's talk a little bit about the homeless youth determinations so basically as you as you saw on the on the fafsa page there the person's um you know, listed there, listed there are those who have the authority to make a homeless youth determination other than a financial aid administrator. They also have that authority. So here are the three, the three parties. So a local homeless education liaison at the high school. So under the McKinney-Vento Act, every local education agency must designate a liaison for homeless students to basically ensure that they're identified, ensure that school personnel are receiving training, um, and to ensure that students are informed of their rights and services. Um, that they might be eligible for as homeless students. Um, and so they can make a determination. And this is actually the, the most common person that makes this determination. The, the second person or, or authority is the director or designee of a Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, so an RHYA funded shelter or transitional living program, TLP. And then a director or designee of a U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, so a HUD funded um, shelter or transitional housing program um, so they can make the determination as well. 
And although these individuals could previously only make determinations for youth that they were currently working with, um, that has changed. So for example, uh, the local district liaison could only make a determination for a current high school student and a shelter provider could only make a determination for a current resident. So that is no longer the case. These individuals can now make determinations for former students or former residents um, in subsequent years as long as they have the necessary information to do so. And also a caveat here, in the case of the school district liaisons, they can only make determinations for youth through age 23. So while they can make those subsequent determinations, they can't do that after the youth is older than 23. And here's a template that you guys can use if you are any of these people um, that are in those three categories for a very easy template to use for the determination letter. You just have to make sure you update the year and input the youth information. But um, you can get that um, from Schoolhouse Connection. They make that available. And I also, um, from what I understand from talking with schools, you can submit um, a homeless youth determination letter at any time after July 1st of the year prior to the award year. Um, some schools say that you have to have the documents in by, you know, June 1st before they start school in the fall, um, you know, of that year. Um, so it's probably, you know, safe to say as, as usual, earlier the better, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I would, you could also inquire with that individual school about, about their timeline. So jumping back into the application. So uh, this is the page it'll take you to after you've checked that box of you know, who's gonna, gonna provide that homeless use determination. So as long as you don't check none of the above, this is the next um, thing that you see. And basically this is going to, um, you're gonna indicate household size. So, um, you know, the uh, you and um, anyone that you've indicated previously. So if you are married, um, that would automatically uh, populate on the screen. And then if you indicated in the dependency section, for, so for your own children, that you have children, you also have to enter that number of the number of correct number of children. Clarification: you know your siblings or or other relatives that might be with you, um, your family of origin, foster family, you know people living in your if you're in a group home or if you're in a you know a housing program. Um, others who live with you wouldn't be included in this household size. Okay. And then for number of college or number in college, you're going to want to enter one unless you have a spouse. Um, who uh, is also going to be attending college at least half time. So uh, when students are asked um, whether they want to ask, answer questions about their parents, you want to make sure if you are dealing with a, a youth who qualifies as an independent student that they answer no um, here. And uh, this is kind of the, the last page if students selected that, you know, indicated that one of the three authorities is providing a determination. This is the last kind of page for them in the dependency section. But what I want to do now is I want to back up because this is kind of like a choose your own adventure. If you indicate one of the three authorities will be uh, providing a determination, it takes you one route. And if you indicate none of the above because you don't have one of those three authorities to make the determination, it takes you a different route. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to back up a little bit and we're going to talk about what it means or what, what should happen if, if the student doesn't have one of the three authorities to make that determination. And then we'll go back through the application as if that was what you selected, the none of above. None of above. So, uh, you know, what if they don't have, have someone, right, to make that determination? So then what they would do is they would answer yes to being homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. But then they would select, like I said, none of the above when asked which authority will make the determination. Then they would visit the school's financial aid office um, so that the financial aid administrator can actually be the one to make the determination. If the financial aid administrator is making the determination and there's no written documentation available, the determination may be based on a documented interview with the student. Um, so, you know, the, the financial aid administrator is not required to get a third party verification, but they can request it and require it. It gives them this discretion. Um, the easiest thing to do is to have a determination letter because it leaves out a lot of individual discretion. If the youth has received services from a HUD um, housing program or RHYA program, you know, 
or they're acquainted with the McKinney Venture Liaison at their high school, even if they're a few years out, the best thing to do is to go back to one of those people and get and get the letter. Um, and you know, if the financial aid administrator receives a determination letter from one of those three authorities, they can't question it, they can't throw it out. You know, they have to take that for what it is. So it's 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 the best route um, to go. And if one more thing on this slide, you know, if the financial aid administrator is making the determination, um, it might look different at different schools, but it could be as simple as you know a conversation with the student or they can reach out to those people that are in that last little, those four boxes at the bottom of the slide for kind of, like I said, for supportive information. Um, so if you have any of those people that might be able to assist, that's also, you know, the youth, um, it's good for them to connect with those, those people as well. So um, as I mentioned, if there's no written documentation available, the determination may be based on a documented interview with the student. Um, and the financial aid administrators are required to determine if the student is unaccompanied at homeless and homeless or at risk of homelessness um, without regard to why the student is homeless. So it's not about making judgments or saying whether they should or shouldn't be homeless. It's just a factual, are they or are they not? Um, and like I mentioned, if they receive that determination from one of the listed authorities, the administrator must accept it. Um, I think I also mentioned about the dorms that if they're in a dorm, they still may be considered an unaccompanied homeless youth if they would otherwise be homeless. And to reiterate, the student, if they are a homeless youth and that's how they are getting their independent student status, they are going to have to verify this each year they complete the FAFSA. And a note, this is different than um, homeless youth verification for getting priority enrollment. That just happens once and then it's good for six years. The financial aid process is different. So just know that for those of you who do work with, with homeless youth. So back to the application. So we're back at the place where it asks, which of these three individuals can make a determination? If none of them can, as I said, you would select none of the above. It's then going to jump you to this screen. Um, this screen is just clarifying that the student has indicated that they're homeless or at risk of being homeless and that no one's providing a determination. And then it reiterates that the student should go see the financial aid administrator. And then here, the next screen um, is where the student would select I am an unaccompanied and e I am unaccompanied and either homeless or at risk of being homeless and will not provide information about my parents. Go to the next screen and you know it explains basically that the student's expected family contribution, what we talked about in the beginning of the webinar that's used to as part of the kind of equation for determining need-based aid. Um, will not be calculated until the financial aid administrator makes the determination that they meet the homeless conditions and are therefore not required to provide parental information. It also notifies students of the option to get that written evidence of their situation or to participate in an interview with the administrator. So now that the application has provided some additional information um, that we've kind of went into in depth um, on those additional slides, um, about kind of what it means to not enter parental information, they again are going to ask um, if the student is an unaccompanied homeless youth or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. And again, you know, you're going to select that first option um, to not submit information about their parents and acknowledging that they'll follow up with the financial aid administrator after submitting the FAFSA. So as, uh, you know, as with um, foster youth, you know, for independent students, you're going to skip through this parent demographic section, like you're actually not even going to see it. So this is what it looks like for those who do complete it, um, complete the information about their parents. But for homeless youth, you're going to actually skip this entire section because you've indicated you're not going to um, enter the information. So it'll jump from dependency status straight into financial information. So now I'm going to pass it back over to Jessica to walk us through this next section of the FAFSA. Jessica, are you maybe on mute? Um, can well, you hear me now? My phone was oh, having some difficulties there. Oh, yes, I was just getting ready to uh, think of another idea here. Yes, you. Uh, All right. I can hear you now. Fantastic, sorry about that. 
All right, so we're gonna transition now to the financial information section. There's gonna be three options for students to select and we're gonna walk through each option. The first option will be if they select, choose to select that they've already completed their IRS income tax return. Option B will be if they are not going to file an IRS income tax return. And option C will be for students that will file. Next slide. Great, so this just shows on this screen those three options that I mentioned. Again, it's gonna be asking their financial information from the prior, prior year, so make sure that students are aware of which year they're asking for. So for students applying for the 2019 academic school year, uh, they're gonna be asking information for 2017. Next slide. So we'll start off with those that select already completed. Next slide. So students have two options. If they did file taxes in 2017, they can actually have it, that information automatically preloaded into their FAFSA application. They can do this by using the IRS data retrieval tool and clicking on the button on the bottom that says link to IRS. The information will be secure. Once it's preloaded, it won't actually show the numbers from their tax return. It'll just show that the information has been transmitted. Now, sometimes there are issues with the data retrieval tool, so students do have the option of entering in their information manually, um, or if they just don't want to use the data retrieval tool, they can do that as well. And if they don't have a copy of their tax return, they can download a free copy on the IRS website. Next slide. So to link their information, they're actually gonna leave the FAFSA and go to a new site through the IRS website. So they'll just click on the button that says proceed to IRS site. Next slide. So the first screen that's gonna pop up, there's actually a little box. It's nothing that's wrong. They can just click okay and minimize is that box. Next slide. Next slide, please. Looks like maybe it's freezing. Jessica, tell me which Doesn't slide you want to be It seem to be transitioning on. on my end. I'm not sure if that's a error on my slide. computer or if it's moving tell me on. Which, which slide you're seeing? Is it the irs.gov slide that get my federal income tax information? Is that what you're seeing? I'd still stuck on the slide that has the warning box on my end. Okay, well, so we are um, we are on the slide right after the warning box slide. So I don't know if you're able to, um, I don't know if you have notes in front of you that you can use to proceed since mm -hmm. I'm guessing everyone else can see it. It says we have a 95% audience view. Can someone let me know if they see the, the um, the slide that has the warning box or whether it's the next slide without the warning box and that would be helpful if you can type into the questions box then we'll know whether it's jessica's computer or my computer okay it looks like everybody else sees it so i don't know if you're able oh. to proceed all right so Thanks it's now showing so let's see if we can move along um if not we might have to transition to um, a backup plan here <laughs> okay let's give it a try all right, great. So on this slide, um, on the screen, some of the information on the beginning will be preloaded in terms of their name, uh, their social security number, they won't actually be able to adjust that, that will be pre-filled. And then they're gonna have to add their address. Now this is the address that they filed and had on file for their 2017 tax return. So the address that they list here needs to be the same address and match so that they can find their tax return in the system. And once they do that, they can click Submit and go to the next slide. It should have advanced. Are you seeing it? 
And it seems to be freezing, I guess, on my end again. I'm not are sure what's able, happening. Jessica, are you able to proceed without? Yeah, it must be an error. Uh, something happening on my end. I'm not quite sure what it is. I've got full internet. And are you able to proceed without seeing the slides, or do you need to see them? Jessica, can you hear me right now? Okay, so I think Jessica's having some, obviously some technical difficulties. Why don't we um, try proceeding without her? I'm going to just move some things around my screen here. Um, I'm going to continue to go through this until she kind of gets her, um, her situation worked out. I'm just going to tell her to try logging back in. Um, Sorry, everybody. All right. So I think she was just, as she was saying, um, you would, uh, for the IRS uh, data retrieval tool, you'd click Submit um, to retrieve the IRS data or return to FAFSA to, um, to go back to the FAFSA. So next, you're going to um, basically be able to link to your income tax information. And so uh, you're going to check the transfer my tax information box and then click transfer now to carry this data back into your FAFSA. If you don't want to do this, you would just check the other box and it would, uh, it would discontinue use. Um, and then just to clarify, they, they, they want to make sure that people know this is secure, um, that the information will not display on the IRS page or on the FAFSA.edgov um, website. So um, that would be it for if you are using the IRS data retrieval tool, you'll get an alert message to indicate that it was successfully transferred and, um, and, then, uh, and then your data cannot be uh, changed or viewed. And then I'm, I want to go back here. Um, so if the student clicked on no thanks for using the IRS data retrieval tool, they'd then be asked several questions about income and tax information from their federal income tax return. Um, and we do strongly recommend that people do use, for students who file taxes, that they do use the data retrieval tool. It makes things uh, definitely much, much simpler um, when completing the FAFSA. So then the student would be asked, if they didn't use the data retrieval tool, the student would be asked to provide information from their tax return, um, including the type of tax return filed, the adjusted gross income, and then how much was earned from working. So then let me just move to this next section and look at uh, Jessica's notes here to make sure that I have a full picture. If I can access them. Thanks everyone for your patience. So here it says if you indicated that you filed an IRS form 1040 and your income was below a certain threshold, um, you'll be asked if you're a dislocated worker. If you're unsure about this, you can click, click the help icon for a full definition. If you answer yes, the financial aid administrator at the college may require proof that you or your spouse is a dislocated worker. We know that this is not going to you know, um, apply to many uh, young people you work with, but it's good to definitely know this information. We know that the, um, all of the kind of uh, the tax information can be very confusing. For those who, who file taxes, sometimes they are reticent about kind of uh, accessing or sharing this information. So again, we just want to encourage them to use the IRS data retrieval tool because it is a much simpler um, way of, of completing this, this part of the FAFSA. So then you might be asked if you received any federal benefits in 2017 or 18, um, and you can see below examples of what some of those benefits might be. Simone, I think I'm back in. Can you hear me? Yes. Now, do you see the slide that says student additional IRS info and then student information? I do. So Great. We'll give so I will go. let you take it from here. My apologies. 
All right, so on this slide, they're going to be asking them to enter the information from their tax form. Um, this FAFSA application also makes it easy for them. It'll let them know exactly what line on their tax return form that they're actually referencing so they can match that up easily. Next slide. It's, it's advanced, so I don't know if you are, again, aren't seeing it, if you can All right. possibly so continue this, on. This one is the student questions for tax filers only. So depending on the questions that they answered on the previous section, they may be able to skip these questions about additional questions about their income and their assets. If they'd like to skip them, that's definitely fine. There's no penalty for choosing yes and skipping the remaining questions. Otherwise, they can answer those additional questions. Next slide. Here they're going to be asked about, again, additional financial information. So there's one part on this section that I do want to highlight. Um, one of the questions on here is asking if they've received any federal work study. So perhaps you're working with a student that has already been in college or a continuing college student and they received federal work study in the past. What they essentially need to do is enter that federal work study information twice. They will have entered it one time in the beginning about money that they earn from working and then they're going to enter it again here and it's actually going to be subtracted from their total income so it won't count against them and it won't count towards their total gross income next slide This section is going to be asking them about untaxed income. Uh, and there just are a few considerations we wanted to highlight of certain types of untaxed income that are more common that students actually don't have to report. So for example, if you're working with any students that are in extended foster care, they might be receiving benefits. They might be receiving a check if they're living in a supervised independent living placement or if they're in a housing program such as a THP plus foster care program. Even if you are working with a foster youth that is receiving a SILT payment, even if that check is sent directly to them, they actually do not have to report this as income. So we just want to make sure that students are aware of this. There are also other types of common income that they don't have to report, such as CalWORKs or SSI benefits as well. Next slide. And lastly, again, they'll be asked if they want to skip questions about their assets, and they definitely can. In case you're working with a student that happens to make a lot of money, um, they will have to provide additional information, but for most of our students, they won't need to. So for the sake of time, we won't show you what those questions are, since most students will be able to skip these questions. Next slide. All right, so the next option, we just went through what a student would do if they had filed taxes. This next section is for students that are going to select the option that they're not going to file taxes. Next slide. So a student that would select this option, it could potentially be a student that maybe they didn't work in the prior prior year, or maybe they worked but they just didn't make that much money and they aren't going to have to file taxes. So if a student doesn't know how much money they need to have made to actually be required to file taxes, we have that listed up here on the slide. So for example, in 2017, if you were single, and under 65 and your gross income was at least $10,400, then you would need to file a tax return. So for students that made less than that, they wouldn't have to. And gross income is the total income paid to the student before any deductions or taxes were taken out. Now, I do want to note something that's important about this option. There's been a new requirement from the federal government. If students select that they're not going to file, many of them may be flagged for additional verification. They might be flagged to actually prove that they didn't file taxes. And they'll be required to submit a form, an IRS verification of non-filing. So there's a few different ways that students can get this form. And I just want to note that it can be kind of a complicated process. Uh, it is a form that's free of charge, and they can either go to the IRS website to download it electronically. But just as a note, there's actually a lot of security requirements for students to be able to just download it online. For example, they have to have a cell phone in their name, have a credit card or auto loan or mortgage. So for a lot of students, they actually won't be able to just download the information on the website. 
they'll probably have to request the form to be mailed to them or they can call the IRS phone number to do it automated over the phone or they can go on the website and actually just download the form themselves. It's that IRS form 4506T and they can check box seven to complete that form. Next slide. So here's where the student, similar questions to the previous section, they would enter how much money they earn from working. Next slide. And again, these questions as well are similar to the other section, asking about any other types of income that they received. Again, if they received federal work study, they would enter it both in the first question that asks the total amount they earned from working, as well as here again to indicate which portion of that income was from federal work study. Next slide. And again, similar to the first section, there will be a set of questions again also asking about untaxed income and just as before there are certain types of benefits that do not have to be reported under untaxed income such as the AB12 benefits, CalWORKs, SSI, etc. Next slide. And again they can skip their questions about additional assets if they would like. Next slide. So the third option is C, and this would be for students that select that they will file their IRS income tax return. Next slide. So this is really for a student that should have filed, but they didn't file and they intend to file, they would select this option. A message will appear to confirm that they actually have missed the deadline to file taxes, but that they still do plan to file an income tax return. Now, if a student selects this option, they're gonna be asked a series of questions to estimate how much money they think they made in 2017, but ultimately they do need to go back into the FAFSA and update their information once they file their taxes. Next slide. And to estimate their income, they can either put in the information from their taxes from the prior year if they think that information is similar, or they can use an income estimator calculator to try and estimate how much money they think they made in that year. Next slide. So the rest of the questions in that will file section are the same as the other sections, so we won't go through those as well, but those are the three options for the financial aid section. Now they're ready to do the final section of the FAFSA. They're almost done, the sign and submit section. Next slide. So before they sign and submit, they have the opportunity to review all the information that they already entered into the application. We definitely want students to review this information, make sure it's accurate, make any edits if necessary, and if possible, to print this so they have it for their future reference. Once they've looked at it and everything looks good, they can move to the next page. And before they sign, they just have to agree to the terms and conditions and then click next. And then they're almost there. This is where they can click the button to sign the FAFSA. And as I mentioned earlier, they have created the FSA ID and that's gonna serve as their legal signature. So they sign this FAFSA, they'll click next, and then they'll click another button that says submit my FAFSA now, and then they are done. Next slide. And once they do that, they're gonna get a confirmation page to show that they submitted their FAFSA. And again, if possible, I'd have them print this page for their records. Uh, they'll also receive a copy of it via email. And if they need to make any changes, they do need to wait a few days until their student aid report is sent to them. This can take a few days or it can even take a few weeks after filing their FAFSA. Thanks, Jessica. So we're going to speed through this very last section after the FAFSA. And if anyone has questions about this, they can always follow up at a later date. So one thing to remember is it takes a few days for the FAFSA to be processed. Once they log back in, they're going to see this message. Um, students can then, they, if they made a mistake, they can make a correction by choosing Make FAFSA Corrections. Um, and then they can also view and print their student aid report. Um, they can also uh, 
and oh, and then when they do go and, and view or print their student aid report, by the way, um, they will go to a page and they'll be asked for that FSA ID username and FSA password. So just, again, remember to, to keep that handy. Um, and then they'll be able to, to view that student aid report. So this is what the student aid report looks like. Um, this is uh, kind of just a standard, you know, so you can recognize it, but um, not much to say here. Let's move on. Kind of three parts to maximizing financial aid. Um, they complete the FAFSA or the California um, DREAM Act application. If they're a foster youth, they want to make sure and complete a separate Chafee application. Um, and then everyone wants to create a web grants account. Um, the web grants account will allow youth to manage their, their Cal grant, and if they are a foster youth, their, their Chafee grant. Here is information on web grants. Um, they'll want to set up an account and uh, basically um, they can, you know, they can update school information, address changes, um, make other connection, um, corrections, and uh, you can also um, verify whether your GPA verification has been received for um, applying for the Cal Grant. So an important thing to note is there, you're not done, right? Once you submit that, that FAFSA application, like we said, you're not done. You might be flagged for verification. 30% of all students are flagged, and actually a higher number, like more than half of students who are, who are um, income-based federal Pell Grant eligible, um, get flagged for general verification. So this means the school might ask for additional documents, including they might ask for that non-filing form if you didn't file taxes. The school might, might also just ask for kind of some general, other general um, documents that, that vary from school to school. So a few resources, I'm not going to go over these, but they will be sent to you later, so you can look at them um, on, your, on your own at a later date. I want to jump into Q&A. We've got a lot of great questions here, and we have Mark, who is a financial aid expert, to answer them. So let's dive in. Um, if your student is incarcerated, can they complete the FAFSA as an independent student, Mark? Mark, are you perhaps muted? Sorry about being muted. So a student who's uh, a ward of the court and a student who's ward of the state are two different things. Ward of the state is someone who's incarcerated. Ward of the court is when the court has assumed parental responsibility for the child. So if you're underage and um, you're incarcerated, you're still a dependent student dependent on your parents. Um, also, students who are incarcerated in a federal or state facility may be ineligible for many forms of financial aid. Thanks, Mark. Another question, just to clarify. So an undocumented student would not complete the FAFSA, correct? An undocumented student would complete the California DREAM Act application? That's correct. Uh, undocumented students are considered to be like international students. They are not eligible for U.S. federal student aid. Uh, students who are, are eligible uh, for filing the FAFSA are U.S. citizens, permanent residents, and a very limited uh, set of um, eligible non-citizens. That includes people from Puerto Rico or the um, uh, uh, Republic of Palau or uh, Republic of Micronesia, um, and uh, students who have been granted asylum, not students who have applied for asylum. Thank you. The, mo the new mobile app for the FAFSA, can you use that for a renewal FAFSA application? Not yet. That's in the works. Got it. And a question about the Cal Grant. If the student applies for college a year or years after they've graduated high school, do they still need to submit a GPA verification form for the Cal Grant? If they have attended college, they'll need a GPA from the college. And my understanding, though, is that if they haven't um, attended college and their, their most recent GPA is from high school, they will need to get that information from the high school. Got it. And um, this is, I think, uh, just a con there's some confusion. Um, if the foster, if, if the youth is a foster youth and is living in a group home, but is not homeless, would they also enter the other children living in the group home when they're talking about no. household on that page? No, right? No, no. it's 
just themselves. Now, if they're married, they include their spouse. If they have children of their own, they would include them. But the other people living in that group home are not part of their household size. Got it. And now um, someone said, did you say, Jessica, that they don't have to report federal work study income? So is that or for Mark. me or for Jessica? <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe for Mark. Yeah, sure. Right. So federal work study money um, is not um, reported as uh, taxable income on the FAFSA. Um, and it, uh, if it is included in taxable income, it gets subtracted out. Um, the idea is that uh, you shouldn't have to pay um, and be eligible for less financial aid because you received financial aid. Got it. Two more questions and then we're going to close. The first one, um, what if someone temporarily does not have custody of their child? Should they list them on the FAFSA? Um, that is an interesting question and I would have to know more about the nature of the temporary custody situation. But uh, generally speaking, the, if they, for most of that award year, are going to be supporting that child, um, they uh, can list that child as a member of the household, uh, even if that child is temporarily absent from the household, um, so long as for the, mo for the duration of the year. And maybe a short period in the year the child isn't living with them, that's fine, uh, so long as for the that entire uh, academic year, they are providing more than half support. Child doesn't need to live with them. Thank you. And our last question, I've heard filling out the IRS non-filing non verification form is really complicated. Any tips for simplifying the process? And I'm sorry, everyone, that that happened to be the section that we had technical difficulties on, and I covered for Jessica because uh, it's already in a confusing section. So we apologize that we got those technical difficulties. Maybe, Mark, you can shed some light on simplifying the process. Right. So you use the same form, IRS Form 4506-G, that is used to get a tax return transcript, to get a tax account transcript. There is a checkbox on there to get a, uh, a verification of non-filing letter. And it's two-page form. It's pretty straightforward to complete. You send it in, uh, and then you wait for the IRS to send back the verification of non-filing letter. Now, if the IRS doesn't have re any record of you at all, um, they might not send back anything. It's, um, it's only if they have a record of you and they have, uh, and, and you didn't file a tax return for that particular year that they would uh, send back the verification and non-filing letter. They might uh, send out something different uh, if they have absolutely no record of information of you at all. So. For example, if you're a student who's independent and you've never ever filed a federal income tax return because you've always been under the earning threshold, the IRS might not have any record of your social security number in their system. Uh, and so then you might not get the verification and non-filing letter, but you should still, it's the same process to request it. Thank you, Mark. And thanks, everyone, for joining us and being patient with us through our tech issues. Thanks, Jessica, and thanks, Mark, for uh, presenting today. We appreciate it. I hope everyone has a great rest of the week.